Powerball debate tonight. Should a gun distributor be held liable for a shooting death? A Florida jury has awarded the widow of a shooting victim, Barry Grunow, $1.2 million from a gun distributor, saying the distributor is partially liable for Grunow's murder. Our hardball correspondent David Schuster reports that this is the first lawsuit in the country in which a gun company has in any way been held responsible in a murder case. It's the age-old question, do guns kill people or do people kill people? Yesterday, a Florida jury said people who distribute guns kill people. Basically, after this decision, I can guarantee you that gun distributors are going to be quaking in their boots. Sort of the case yeah. involves a young murderer you have heard about before, 16-year-old Nathaniel Brazil. Two years ago, on his last day in a Florida school, Brazil was kicked out. He went home, grabbed his uncle's gun, returned to class, and shot a teacher, Barry Grunow, in the face. The jury in the civil lawsuit said the inexpensive gun should have had a safety lock, and that the distributor is liable to Grunow's family to the tune of more than a million dollars. But would a safety lock have stopped a crazed teenager? Uh, it certainly would have prevented him from uh, being able to use the gun that he uh, took uh, from, I guess, the home of, of someone that he knew. Uh, if it had been locked, he would not have been able to use it. But the gun lobby says the jury's decision that the distributor is 5% responsible is insignificant. I don't consider that to be a landmark case. I don't consider this to be a mandate. Uh, I consider this to be a compromise, and uh, I feel that it's a resounding victory not only for the Valor Corporation, uh, but for gun manufacturers across the country. Critics liken the decision to blaming beer distributors for drunk driving or candy stores for children's cavities. But gun control advocates say that everybody should be responsible for their actions, or in this case, inaction. The question is, should gun manufacturers and distributors be liable when they refuse to add trigger locks, or should the person who pulls that trigger be the only one to blame? I'm David Schuster for Hardball in Washington. John Renzulli is the attorney for the Vower Corporation, the gun distributor named in the Florida case, and Joe Takapina is a criminal defense attorney. Mr. Renzulli, I've got to ask you this. How can you call it a victory when it costs your client a million bucks and it's a landmark case for the first time ever uh, forcing a, a gun distributor to pay for a crime. Chris, thanks for having me on the show. That's the first order of business. Second order of business, this was a resounding victory. The plaintiffs came into this case and said that this gun had no legitimate purpose. It was a cheap, lousy Saturday night special that shouldn't have been sold at all. Well, that jury of six women came back and said, this gun has a legitimate self-defense purpose. It's not a Saturday night special. It's not defectively designed, and it's not negligently designed. As for the one million, there's an appellate court. We're going to be up there, and, and, the, and the issue that they found on is clearly outside of Florida law. We are unbelievably happy and elated at this verdict. Okay, let me ask Joe Cacopina. Joe, why do, you, why do you think the jury found for the plaintiff here? Well, because I think they took a look at the, the, the product, the gun, and realized that it has absolutely no business uh, on the market. I mean, it's not for target practice, Chris. It's not a collectible. Uh, it's not for hunting. It serves well, what one purpose. the particular issue of it, if it not having a gun lock? Was that what turned this case in my, against the defendant? In my, in my opinion, that's the, that's the sole issue. I wasn't really hopped up on the issue, Chris, about you know, being uh, marketed towards children or because of its size was marketed towards juveniles. But I, I, I think clearly the fact that this gun did not have a safety uh, was what caused this jury to give a $1 million verdict against Valor. And if Valor thinks that paying $1 million every time one of their guns is used uh, uh, in, a, in a crime or in a homicide is a victory, uh, they'll probably be out of business in what, about a month or so. So uh, I don't see how anyone could call it a victory. John, and, and why, did, why didn't your uh, manufacturer, your client, put a gun lock on this particular gun? this handgun. Chris, uh, at the time that this gun was sold, it was 1989, and there were no gun locks available for any guns. As a matter of fact, today, for a 25 caliber gun, there is no gun that's manufactured in this country that has a gun lock. You know, it's, it's easy to just say, put a lock on it, put that gun lock on it. And sure. by the way, uh, the plaintiffs brought an expert that uh, placed a lock in this gun that the, their expert and our expert was able to pick in six seconds with a paper clip. Now, I mean, if that's, if that's the lock that you want to rely on, uh, I certainly wouldn't. And, and either, 
Either with my client. Make a better no, lock. You, you, make it, a better lock. You are that... the gun producers. You are the manufacturers. If you want to take on the task of making a killing uh, machine a weapon, make a better lock. I mean, that's a ridiculous answer, but Joe, because uh, the lock Joe, out there obviously... now be picked. Joe, obviously, you're not, you're not a person that deals with guns or fires guns or, or No, I'm or not, I'm, guns I'm not but I'm a person who, who let me, gets let me to a courtroom and he has Joe, a jury give you a million-dollar verdict and you call Joe, it a victory. Let me, let me, let me separate this. Just question. I want to ask the questions here, John. If, if this gun were a shotgun, which is not considered a particularly you know, controversial weapon in most parts of the United States, having a shotgun somewhere in your house, and, so, and this kid, the murderer, went in and grabbed a shotgun out of somebody's basement and had a couple of, and had some ammo in it. Would that person, would that shotgun distributor be vulnerable to this kind of uh, lawsuit, John? You know, if you take the plaintiff's allegations to their logical end, Chris, any gun that can be stolen and misused for intentional purposes to kill somebody would have liability. But you that can kill somebody no with a BB sense. gun, can't you, with a daisy sure rifle? Sure you could. Sure you could. It, it's possible to, to kill somebody with a bat. Do we call it a crime bat and say don't make it anymore? You can kill yeah, somebody with a bat's in a meant car. To, a bat is meant for hitting baseballs. That's... It's not meant for hitting people. What do you mean, Joe Takapina? Would you hold a, a client uh, uh, liable if they produced a, a shotgun, an all-American shotgun that's in somebody's house, and this kid got in the house, got a hold of the shotgun, took it and shot his teacher with it? Would that be the same case? Chris, here's what it all boils down to. And it was the same thing with the tobacco cases. The jury found, and as they did in the tobacco cases, that the manufacturer, be it tobacco manufacturer or gun manufacturer in this case, could have made their product safer. Period. End of equation. If in, if in the instance you propose, uh, the hypothetical you offer, th there was a, a, something, a manufacturer defect or something the manufacturer could have done to make that shotgun safer, which could have contributed to the death, Yes, they would be liable, just as valid, Valor was liable here. They could have made their product safer. That's what but the jury said. But suppose it was a 20-year-old rifle, a 20-year-old shotgun, and they didn't have locks at the time, like this sub weapon didn't have at the time in 1979. What, what, would, what would be the case then? Would that still be actionable? You know, I, I, quite frankly, Chris, I mean, th that's a hypothetical that I, I think, you know, without having all the facts on hand, I don't know. I mean, I think they could do a host of things, including outlaw them, and, and perhaps if there was a law prohibiting those type of guns being on the street. You have a recall of all that, weapons sold without safety locks? And if people and if people didn't follow that, then maybe perhaps then the manufacturer's off totally. I don't but, think that's, that's constitutional, Joe. You know that's not constitutional. You can't go out there and claim sure. back by the United States government all the guns that went out that didn't have locks on them and require people to return them. No, 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 them. no, 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 Chris, but the authorities can can call them illegal to possess. And okay. if someone's possessing them illegally, that's a different story. Okay, let's take that's a look. That's not Here's the case here. Thanks, Joe. Here's what the vice president of National, Sporting Sp Shot National Shooting Sports Foundation said about this case. This is a disappointing this is disappointing. This was a verdict based on emotion, sympathy for the victim, not the law. The firearm was legally sold and owned, not, but stolen, loaded, and pointed at a criminal. You might as well say Budweiser is responsible for drunk driving. Let me ask you, uh, uh, Joe, do you think this, uh, rather, John, do you think this case meant, went to a million dollars in the jury's verdict because it was an all-women jury? I really don't. I think this jury uh, really looked at this case. Uh, they were very diligent. They looked at the evidence. And that's why they found, Chris, that this gun has a legitimate purpose. It's not a Saturday night But they night gave a million dollars to the, to the plaintiff. They, what are you appealing to? It was a, a clear, clear, clear cut compromise, Chris. If you look at the verdict sheet, which is before me, they put 45% okay. of the liability on the school board, 50% on the, the reckless uh, owner who didn't store his gun properly, okay. and five okay, where does this take? I where... talked to these jurors, Chris. Okay. I Let me ask to you. I've got to ask the question to close out tonight. Where does this take us in terms of malt liquor or any alcoholic product, for example, that has a high quality, quality, quantity of liquor in it? Where does that take us on this kind of cases? You first, John. You, Chris, this, this takes us into the sublime. It, it takes us into uh, it's a situation where if you don't like a product, you start these okay. types of is that where we're going, Joe? To, is that where we're headed this totally Friday night? Scenario, totally are we going to scenario. are we going to be able to charge anybody to uh, try to sue anybody for anything that goes wrong with their product? No, no, but anyone who makes a killing machine, Chris, should make it as safe okay. as possible. That's the bottom line. Okay, thanks a lot. Hey, Chris, right, next, just, just, we got John.